Perfect. Well, thank you all for coming to the Genomics and Health Disparities Interest Group. Uh, so this is our uh, summer directors series. Uh, so we have speakers throughout the year, and uh, we're excited every summer to uh, introduce uh, one of the directors uh, who will give their um, take on genomics and uh, health disparities. So uh, to introduce our speaker uh, this time, I'm happy to bring up one of our interest group organizers, uh, Dr. Candace Middleworth. Good afternoon, my name is Candace Middlebrooks and I'm a research fellow at the National Human Genome Research Institute. I'm also on the committee for the Genomics and Health Disparities Interest Group. It is my pleasure to introduce um, the director of my institute, Dr. Eric Green. Um, Dr. Eric Green, MD, PhD, is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institutes um, at the National Institutes of Health, a position he has held since late 2009. He has been at NHGRI for over 24 years, and while directing an independent research program for almost two decades, Dr. Green was at the forefront of efforts to map, sequence, and understand eukaryotic genomes. His work included significant start to finish involvement in the Human Genome Research Project. As director of NHGRI, Dr. Green is responsible for providing overall leadership of the Institute's research portfolio, as well as other initiatives. In recent years, this has included designing and launching a number of major programs to accelerate the application of genomics to medical care. Beyond NHGRI-specific programs, Dr. Green has also played an instrumental role in the development of several high-profile efforts relevant to genomics, including the Smithsonian NHGRI exhibition, um, Genome Unlocking Life's Code, the NIH Big Data to Knowledge, or BD2K, program, the NIH Genomic Data Sharing Policy, the U.S. Precision Medicine Initiative, and the NIH Data Commons. So without further ado, I'd like to call up Dr. Eric Green to give his talk entitled Realities and Opportunities for Genomics in Addressing Health Disparities. Well, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, Pleasure, pleasure to be here. For those of you standing, I left a vacant seat for you in front. If anyone wants to migrate to the front, there's actually a couple of empty seats if you're interested, but you're also welcome to hang. Um, uh, when I was asked to do this, I jumped at the opportunity. Um, I uh, have great regard for this for, and, and um, was happy to see this interest group form. Um, and uh, certainly, I'm very supportive of it and very enthusiastic about uh, the speakers they have been bringing, and of course, I'm delighted to, to be amongst them um, and uh, see if I can um, provide some context for a number of issues that I think are very important at the intersection between health disparities and genomics. So what I'm going to attempt to do today and then lead in, in talking and then leave uh, time certainly for some discussion is really to cover three areas. Uh, with, uh, first, a very brief but I think important history of genomics. Um, I suspect there's a lot of heterogeneity amongst you in terms of how much detailed knowledge you have about sort of the historical context uh, that have brought us to where we are today with respect to genomic advances, and I want to at least in an abbreviated form give you a little of that. But I, the main part of my talk is to really emphasize some new realities uh, that I think we are facing at the intersection between genomics and, and many issues related to, to health disparities. And then at the end, I want to just briefly talk about the road ahead and encourage you to help us uh, think uh, more strategically about these important topics. So starting with a very brief history of genomics, um, uh, I've been involved in the field essentially from the very beginning. Um, but I really want to remind people what a relatively young discipline genomics is. I think some people believe it's been around a long time as long as genetics. That's simply not true. Uh, in fact, the word genomics was never even put into the scientific or medical press until 1987. It was actually coined at a workshop in Bethesda, Maryland earlier in 1987. And then by the end of the year, they actually started a journal called Genomics. And in the inaugural editorial in the first issue of this new journal called Genomics, the editors wrote uh, a piece that really described this new discipline, which they were naming genomics. Now, why was there a new field created in 1987? I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. It turned out that there had been a series of advances in our technical abilities to analyze DNA, to map it, and to clone it, and to even read out its letters. And the methods 
And approaches for doing that had gotten so efficient that it provided the opportunity to think comprehensively about looking at and characterizing and eventually reading out all the DNA of an organism. And, and it suddenly was recognized that that's its genome. And if you're going to study an entire genome, that's genomics. And imagine if you could do that for the human genome and actually decipher, if you will, the human genetic blueprint. And that, of course, was all part of a discussion about an audacious new project that was being contemplated at the time when the field was named, but then actually became launched by 1990. And of course, that's the Human Genome Project. Um, this is a project that I was very fortunate to get involved in from day one, participated in it until the very end. And it was, by any measure, a very unusual project. It was a big project. It was international, and it was audacious. It was also incredibly successful. It completed in 13 years its goals, a series of them. The ultimate one would be reading out for the very first time and ordering the G's, A's, T's, and C's, all three billion of them that make up the human genome. And that was really quite an accomplishment um, that really signaled, in many ways, the reason why a field of genomics had been named. So genomics has really only been around for a little over three decades. And uh, in a very abbreviated form, I thought it'd be useful for you to hear from me, what do I think are the six big highlights of genomics? If I was going to give you a highlight reel, not the hour version, I'm going to give you the five-minute version. So that's about, you know, that's, that's not very many minutes per decade, but um, you're going to hear basically what I think are the biggest highlights in just quick form. Uh, the first of which really was what I just talked about, and it really was a, a remarkable um, accomplishment. Uh, we sequenced, we read out, we ordered the three billion letters of the human genome for the very first time and made that available on the internet to all people freely around the world. And that will always be the number one highlight as far as I'm concerned for the field of genomics. That was 16 years ago, 2003, when the Human Genome Project ended, we had the first reference sequence of the human genome. And uh, lots has happened in genomics in the last 16 years. But as you might imagine, here at NIH, and in particular our institute, or my institute, the National Human Genome Research Institute, which was originally created by the US Congress to lead the US's efforts in the Human Genome Project. But of course, when the Genome Project ended, uh, we needed to think more broadly. We didn't want to go away. Um, and we also realized that this was just the start of everything. And so what we recognized our key role was going to be at the National Institutes of Health was to do the obvious, put the word genomic next to a word that's very relevant to health. And of course, that word that was used by the popular press at the time or by the scientific press was medicine. And that's where you started to see lots and lots of discussion about genomic medicine, about genomic medicine, genomic medicine. In reality, 16 years ago, when all this was being discussed, and even as the Institute started to think about how are we going to make genomic medicine a reality, the truth of the matter is this is what it felt like. It was sort of a hazy concept. We really weren't quite sure what it was really going to look like and feel like. Uh, we knew that's where we wanted to get, but we needed to bring this into focus. And off we went. As an institute, off we went as a community, and off we went even internationally, recognizing the series of things that were going to be needed going from the fruits of the Genome Project to the realization of genomic medicine, uh, which basically involves the use of genomic information about individual patients to tailor their medical care. Well, what have been the highlights that we've had in, in this journey, if you will, from the Human Genome Project end, which was really the starting line of this journey, to the realization of genomic medicine? I would say there's five other highlights that are worthy of really, high, of really emphasizing because they really have materialized over the last 16 years. Uh, the first of which was very technical. That first human genome sequence, it was really hard to generate, and it was not so cheap. It cost about a billion dollars to generate it which was fine, it was well worth every penny, but it's not exactly the kind of thing you're gonna use here in the clinical center to, to, to help facilitate the medical care of a patient. We needed sequencing genomes to be incredibly cheap, and we've basically done that in 16 years. We've now reduced the cost of sequencing a human genome by essentially a million fold, from about a billion dollars to about a thousand dollars, and it's gonna even get cheaper in the coming years. That was a technological feat I could spend an hour telling you about, but I'm not going to, because I have other things to talk about. But just recognize that without that, nothing else that I'm talking about would be possible. Technical innovation and our ability to inexpensively and increasingly getting more inexpensive uh, read out the letters of a person's genome. With that information, of course, and the technology associated with reading genomes, it allowed us to not just settle with just one 
reference sequence the human genome, we were interested in sequencing lots of people's genomes because we wanted to compare them and we wanted to catalog how people are different in their basic genetic blueprint, where their letters are different from one another. And now we've gone from having one genome sequence to actually having hundreds of thousands. I will change this slide. I'm sure we'll pass the million mark in the coming few years. We now have hundreds of thousands of human genome sequences available to us in public databases. And we've now gone from looking across those 3 billion letters of the human genome. And when the Genome Project ended, we knew of maybe 10,000, 20,000 places that people tended to vary, have a different letter at that position. Now it's about 100 million places that we know exactly where, how people vary, and we know exactly what letter is in place in, in different people. And so we have a very, very rich data set of human variation with respect to their genome, which is very powerful. We want to layer on top of that information when you see a difference in somebody's genome, you want to be able to know, does it make a difference in how the genome functions? Does it actually have a biological influence? Well, to do that, you need to know how the genome works. And in 16 years, we've profoundly advanced our understanding about how the human genome functions. Now, we have a long way to go, but once upon a time, we didn't even know how many genes there were. We now know there's about 20,000 genes. Once upon a time, we didn't even know if genes were most of the DNA or just a small part. We now know that coding portions of genes are only 1.5% of all the letters of the genome. And we now know that outside of these coding regions, these genes, are an incredibly complicated circuitry that dictate where, when, and how genes are turned on and off by which tissues, when, and blah, 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 blah. And we're learning more and more how to characterize it. Now, we have a long way to go in understanding all the complexities of how the genome works and how a spelling difference in those letters influence how the genome works. But we've really advanced our ability to do that. And so we really are now in a very exciting phase of using fundamental tools that are really helping us figure out how the genome works, figure out how variation influences function. And we will be doing this for many more years, but we're on a very good trajectory compared to where we were 16 years ago. Well, once you have the ability to know when a difference in somebody's genome influences how the genome works, you now can design studies to say, well, if it influences how the genome works, how does it influence human traits? We're all very, or just traits in general, we're particularly interested in human traits. And of course, what traits are we the most interested in is diseases. Uh, we're sitting here in the clinical center at the NIH. We passionately care about understanding all the different factors that play into human health and disease. And we have gone from having cursory knowledge about how the genome and differences in the genome influence disease to now really having significant advances in unraveling the genomic basis of human disease. We've made particular strides with rare genetic diseases, diseases that are turn out to be simple because it usually is one gene that's broken, one gene that has a mutation in it. And in fact, we've gone from having knowledge of, by the way, there's about eight or 9,000 rare diseases that have been characterized. When the Genome Project began, only 61 did we actually know what the mutated gene was. But today, it's over 5,000. And it grows by dozens and dozens every single month. And so we're still trying to close the gap. We have still a few thousand more to characterize. But we have made massive, massive advances in understanding the genomic basis of rare diseases. We've also made major strides in understanding the genomic basis of a disease like cancer, which is basically a genomic disease. And we know that, and we'll get more and more knowledge in the coming years, understanding how genomic changes lead to different types of cancer and what the implications of those changes are for diagnosing and treating cancer. And then there's the whole world of common diseases, and these are the diseases that affect humanity more than any. These are the common diseases like hypertension, diabetes, autism, Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. Those are really complicated because it's not a single gene. It's usually multiple genes that have a few variants in them, often what is a greater contribution of the environment and other and social factors that play into it. And so this will be the big challenge for the coming 10 and 20 years, but I still feel with some successes and a much better knowledge of the right approach to use to characterize common diseases. I'm very optimistic and think we should be very proud of these first 16 years for common diseases, certainly for cancer, and unbelievably so for rare diseases. My last highlight I'm particularly proud of because, to be honest with you, when I became director of the Institute now almost 10 years ago, I sort of would stop my talks at about this point because I didn't really have anything to say about medicine. I got as far as diseases, but I never got to actually anything about medicine. But I get to put one more highlight on here because now 
10 years later, and certainly over the last six and seven years, we have seen emerging some of the first, some of the earliest, but clearly vivid examples of how genomic medicine is actually going to become a reality. And it's been very gratifying. Even though I know there's so much more to come, I feel like we really have transitioned from where we were 16 years ago to being in a position much more like this. It is much more in focus. And while we have a lot more to do, I think we can be really quite impressed with the fact that we have real life examples of genomic medicine being implemented in the real world. I'm often asked, what are the hot areas of genomic? What are these examples? What are these vivid examples? And I almost always cite, at least as of up to today, sort of these four areas. Um, one, as I told you about earlier, cancer genomics. I mean, the world of cancer research and increasingly cancer care is absolutely changing because of genomics and the tools of genomics. Pharmacogenomics, big word, but it's just the fact that everybody seems to respond differently to different medications. And much of that, not all of it, but much of that is scripted in differences in our genomes that affect how we metabolize drugs. Knowledge of those genomic differences is beginning to help tailor the selection of the appropriate drug for the appropriate person. And this is becoming more and more real for more and more medications. Having a patient with an unknown disorder, a rare disease, and having them sitting in front of you and not knowing what is wrong with them, and then just saying, well, I'll just sequence their genome, and upwards of 50% of the time you will figure out what's wrong with them. By the way, that approach has absolutely was, was put into sort of motion and reduced to practice right here in this building in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. But now this has been generalized. Hundreds of patients with rare diseases get their genome sequenced every month, and we are figuring out what is wrong with them in a, an amazing <coughs> fraction of cases. This is something I never thought I would necessarily see in my career, maybe not even in my lifetime. It's already here and now. And the last example, because it's actually the largest example in terms of sheer number, is prenatal genetic testing has been around for a long time, but non-invasive methods whereby you don't need to um, do an invasive procedure like an amniocentesis to access the fetal DNA, to study the, the, the unborn baby's chromosomes, rather doing a simple blood draw and detecting the small amount of fetal DNA that naturally is shed from the placenta and floats around in the maternal bloodstream. This is, this, is, this is absolutely done every day, not just dozens of times, hundreds of times. Worldwide, and, and the companies have set this up, so it's a huge industry now. 10 million pregnant women are expected to get non-invasive genomic testing done around the world over the next year. It is absolutely the number one genomic medicine test, and it's happened very quickly, and it's all related to technology development. So, those are the hot areas. So that was about 12 minutes and three decades of genomics, of highlights. <laughs> but what I hope you took away from that is this incredible surge, this incredible arc of scientific to medical story, and how the wind is to our back, and there's a lot more that's going to happen. So if you haven't noticed, um, I'm an enthusiastic person, and I'm also quite optimistic about many, many things. But I didn't want to leave you the impression that everything is simple, or that there aren't major problems to solve, or that there aren't imperfections in this storyline of genomics. So that leads me to my second area, which is, relates to new realities. This is like cold water in the face kind of realities. We don't have this perfect by any stretch of the imagination. With that said, the optimistic side of me is to say, but that also means there's opportunities. We can do better, and we should think about how to do better, and we should enable people and enable the system to improve. And those are, the, those are the opportunities that come with these realities. So I'm going to tell you about three major realities that are here and now and need to be dealt with. But there are opportunities for dealing with each of these. So reality number one in terms of new realities and opportunities. There is a lack of diversity in genomics, full stop. There's a lack of diversity. We have missed the mark, um, and this really does represent a problem. This has been studied for a number of years, and in fact, uh, just uh, several years ago, uh, this comment piece uh, by Pop Joy and Fullerton sort of updated an analysis that they had done um, about seven years earlier, where they looked to see um, how genomics was doing with respect to, to population diversity. And, and, and while there were some signs of improvement, I don't think you would say overall things got better. 
And shown here is one of the figure, which I'm going to drill in a minute. But the, the high-level summary is they went from, in 2009, as a field, if you looked at the large studies, genomic studies that were analyzing populations for different diseases, in 2009, 96% of all the individuals being studied were of European um, ancestry. Uh, leaving a very small sliver of non-European ancestry. Now, the good news was that in seven years, from 2009 to 2016, that situation had improved by some measure in terms of you could see the, it going down to 81% European ancestry and 19%. But before you get too um, optimistic about that trend, we should drill down a little bit further and show that there are some imperfections. So yes, there was a five-fold increase over seven years with respect to the proportion of non-European samples. The problem is, is that 78% of the increase came from populations that were, were limited um, to, to basically of Asian ancestry, from Japan, China, Korea, India, and other populations of East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So that worked well for those populations. But what it did, though, then, is that all the other ancestral populations, African and Latin American ancestry, Hispanic, ancestry, native and indigenous peoples, they represented less than 4% of, of, that, of that increase. And some of those populations are the most vulnerable and traditionally underserved populations um, in many of the richest nations in the world. So while there were signs of improvement, they weren't sort of evenly distributed by any means, and they were still leaving um, uh, the, the mark of having a lack of adequate diversity in genomics research. Um, then earlier this year, another paper was published that did sort of a similar analysis in this 2019 Nature Genetics paper. They basically acknowledged that there was remarkable growth in the number of people who are represented in genomic databases, again, either through sequencing studies or through other studies that involve this examination of, of diseases um, where genomic data was captured um, on individuals. And the total number of participants, and shown at the top are the numbers, and on the, on the bottom graph are the percentages. You could see, the, well, especially the top panel, the numbers went up and up and up, which is great. More data, more data, more data. The problem is, is look at the individual, the different colors, because as you could see, they're sort of not very proportional. And at the far right shows the global population um, in numbers at the top, and then at percentages at the bottom, and you can see what the problem is a significant mismatch where individuals of European descent are over, 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 overwhelmingly represented in these data sets. And many of these other, or essentially all of the other um, population groups are not represented in the data compared to what they are um, on Earth as a population. And this has consequences because it actually turns out that there really are, the data associated with different ancestral populations really is different and when you actually go to analyze the data and you want to have controls and you want to have all the right proper scientific means by which you're going to analyze the data, it is inadequate to simply use the European data when you're analyzing data from other ancestral populations. It just doesn't translate. And as you think about some of the clinical analyses that you may want to do to infer whether certain genomic variants put a patient at risk for a disease, it only works for that same population. It doesn't automatically apply when you move to other populations. It is an inadequate control. What that means is the groups that are not well represented are being left behind because there's inadequate data to facilitate the interpretation of the data being generated. Well, this is, it's not that this is going unnoticed, but the, the problem persists. I can tell you that NHGRI has recognized that we must start fixing these. We don't think we can fix these problems alone. But as leaders in genomic research, we can at least lead and illustrate the proper path forward. So um, earlier, um, um, I guess it was last year, not earlier, this year, last year, uh, we were invited to publish a perspective. Um, and a number of us from the Institute um, uh, put together this perspective um, in, in Nature Genetics that really outlined a number of the things that NHGRI is doing and the importance of doing them and provided a, a, at least an illustrative framework for others to follow and at least recognize uh, how we regard this as an important problem. Um, we, we also voted with our feet. We didn't just write papers. We started changing some of our programs. We started prioritizing some of these things. And just to give you a flavor, uh, we have uh, two among our, our, our programs, our large programs, that are run by our extramural research program, uh, especially in the arena 
of implementing genomic medicine, or in other words, studying the implementation of genomic medicine, are these two uh, projects, uh, CSER, Clinical Sequencing Evidence Generating Research, and IGNITE, Implementing Genomics in Practice. Uh, they each have their own characteristics of what they're trying to accomplish. But as we have gone to renew these programs and, and mature these programs and, and really um, have them represent uh, sort of cutting edge um, programs that are tackling the hardest problems, and amongst the hardest problems is helping to fix these problems with diversity, we've ensured that these programs are addressing these things head on. What do I mean by that? Well, we conscientiously have prioritized diversity as these programs have, have matured. For example, um, in the most recent renewals of these programs, we've required that 60 to 75% of the participants come from underserved populations. Uh, that could include racial and ethnic minority populations, underserved populations, populations who experience poor medical outcomes. We've defined it in broad and, and, and in a systematic way to capture many aspects of diversity. As these studies have been designed, it's not just about who is getting the care, but we really think about how they are getting that care. We recognize that healthcare settings and healthcare systems vary considerably, that different parts of the different populations access healthcare in different ways, and that we don't want to just understand how genomic medicine is going to be implemented at a major academic center. We want to understand how it gets implemented across the diversity of sites that healthcare is delivered. We also want to make sure that we are fundamentally assessing uh, the clinical utility and cost effectiveness of genomic medicine tools and technologies in the real world, which means in diverse settings. So once again, we want to make sure that we've developed the tools to assess whether or not genomic medicine is improving healthcare um, across a diversity of different sites, uh, not just in one site or one type of site like major academic medical center. And finally, we want to understand what the barriers are. We don't want to just know the successes, that, you know, although we want to know those too. We want to identify and address the real world barrier to integrating genomics um, into routine clinical practice um, in different types of healthcare system. And we want evidence um, for how to do that and how to sort of guide clinical decision making um, um, as part of medical care across um, a whole host of different places where medical care is delivered and where genomics can be of help. So that's what NHGRI, amongst the many things we're doing, that's just illustrative of what we, how we are voting with our feet as we say what needs to be fixed. We've been very pleased to recognize that, that there have been um, enhanced uh, diversity um, uh, across different programs at NIH, um, and, and that this has been embraced in other places at NIH, and there's sort of two exemplars I would point out. Some of you might be familiar with the Precision Medicine Initiative, or which sort of has as its mainstream the All of Us Research Program, this effort to enlist across the United States and, and enroll a million or more US volunteers who will be followed in a longitudinal fashion, who will have measured significant amounts of data collected about them, including genomic data. There is a major effort in the All of Us Program to, to make sure that diversity is captured. I can give you some numbers. There are over 142,000 individuals have now completed the, the fundamental first research protocol in, after enrollment in the program. Greater than 80% of the participants are coming from communities who have been, been traditionally underrepresented in research, and greater than 50% are part of a racial or ethnic minority group. And keep in mind, the amount of data that's going to be collected on these individuals <coughs> is going to be remarkable in terms of scope and scale, which I think has great potential in the coming years to give the kind of data sets to be able to really drill down and not leave diversity behind, but actually to actually make it a very a much upfront because of the way the enrollment is being um, conducted. Our colleagues at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in a program that we very, we actually interact with extensively called um, Transomics for Precision Medicine, or TopMed, is another program where so far they have about 144,000 participants, of which about 60% or so with are, are of non-European ancestry. So once again, another example where um, diversity is being embraced in the recruitment up front, and therefore it's be, it will ensure that diversity is not left behind. Even beyond the, the United States, I should point out that population scale genomic studies are sprouting up all over. Like the All of Us program or the, or, or the programs at NHLBI or programs at NHGRI, I can tell you that around the world, major cohort studies are, are, are being um, started or in some cases actually got out of the gates before ours did. And, and in aggregate, and we're actually tracking this, actually a consortium of all these cohort groups coming together. 
And it's really, it's really um, uh, it's, it's heartening to see the diversity that will be represented. At the moment, it's believed there's at least 60 worldwide cohort studies and the, the countries they're in are sort of shown in the colored uh, countries on the map. And in aggregate, there, the enrollment figures might indicate there would be upwards of 30 million individuals who will be participating in these, and they will bring tremendous diversity because of, of ancestral and um, geographic origins, as you can see as you look across uh, the world map. So this will be another important contribution. So I hope I left you with this new reality one. We need to do better. But on the other hand, there are signs that we are doing better, uh, but we, we need to continue to pay attention. So new reality two, and with it, an opportunity. Diverse communities uh, are at risk of facing barriers to accessing genomic medicine. There are barriers now, and they are at risk of actually even getting worse. And we need to really be thinking about this. And there's really an interesting phenomenon that's going on. Because right now, most of the genomic data being generated is being generated as part of research, which means that people like me can help control what happens because I'm in charge. Or more, more humorously, funding agencies are in charge. They can decide through what the money they're giving out as part of research they could require certain things, just as we are requiring certain, and, and all of us is requiring, and these other programs are requiring certain levels of, of, of diversity if you're going to get funds from those funders for conducting research. But there's a twist. The new reality is that the world is changing when it comes to how genomic data is going to be generated. Because it turns out that it is fully expected, based on a study done by this organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, they believe the trend is that the bulk of genomic data is not going to be generated as part of research, but rather it's going to be generated as part of routine medical care by healthcare systems. And these are the projections that, you know, maybe right around now, it's about 20%. But 2022 is not that far away, and the, predict the prediction is that the good news is that genomic medicine is being implemented. The good news is it means that lots of healthcare systems are going to be generating genome sequences on patients Upwards of 80% of all genomic data might, by 2022 might be generated by these healthcare systems. And this is actually the paper. If you were interested, it's in the, it's in the bio archive, preprint archive. Um, and basically, the bottom line is that there's going to be 40 to 50 million human genome sequences predicted to be generated by 2022, but greater than 80% of them is going to be generated as part of healthcare. Well, one might get slightly concerned about this. Because you can't guarantee that access to healthcare, especially places that are implementing genomic medicine most um, aggressively, will be places that will provide equal access to people from all walks of life and all um, ancestral origins. And so will everyone have equal access? And I think that's a fair question. And there's plenty of examples where when it came to new technologies, new developments, new this, new that, there was not equal access. And so the reason this becomes a reality is it, it sort of takes away the control of that from funders because we will be the minority controller of what data is being generated and it puts in the hands of the complicated ecosystem of healthcare to determine who's going to be getting their genome sequenced and therefore what data is going to be available for studying so you love those 40 to 50 million human genome sequences to analyze, but you may not be able to control the characteristics of them. It will be controlled by the ecosystem of genomic medicine. You think about all of these things, and you can immediately become concerned if we don't pay significant attention to access to genomic medicine, um, everyone won't have equal access. There's another nuance associated with access because it's not only just getting your foot in the door, and having your blood drawn to be able to get your genome sequenced, there's also an issue of if you're even going to want to participate in that, or you're going to allow your genome to be sequenced, or you're going to be even part of the conversation about this, is that will you understand what this is about? And will the understanding of genomic medicine be equally distributed across the world's population, or even in the United States, across the, the US population? And this is another issue that NHGRI, among others, think a lot about, is that we are at a point where our technologies and our advances have accelerated so fast and furious that it's pretty clear that a fundamental understanding 
of these advances has not kept pace. And it's not necessarily anybody's fault. In some ways, we're victims of our own success. We've been so successful that we haven't been able to bring it around because we're just going so fast and furious. So we've become very interested in the challenges of, 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 of genomic literacy. And we recognize it is a very complicated problem, and it's not just a single population that we have to think about. We are doing various things um, across several different domains. We think a lot about K through 16. I'm recognizing that just fundamental science is learned in K through 16 stages. And, and we want to do more to improve the framework um, for curriculum development and for implementation of tools that will enable K through 16 students to learn more about genomics, since genomics will become relevant in their everyday life. We need to think about the general public um, uh, from the point of view of just recognizing that um, people and society need to know more about this. We need to engage individuals so they understand more. The fundamentals, we will want to use similar framework we're using for K through 16, but tailor it to a general public community and, and, and really think about, even at a research level, what we should be doing to improve our ability to communicate fundamentals about genomics to patients, because the general public basically are going to be patients. And of course, the other community that we need to be thinking about are the people they'll interface with in the healthcare systems uh, when they access the healthcare system, and that's, of course, these healthcare professionals. Uh, we know there's significant gaps between what doctors and nurses and, physician, and physician assistants and pharmacists know about genomics and what the cutting edge is. And we need to play catch up. And uh, they need to be part of this formula for making sure that fundamental understanding of genomics is provided to patients so they can make informed decisions and they, so that everybody benefits equally uh, from these opportunities. And so th this second reality um, really has to do a lot with thinking about how genomics is going to, and genomic medicine is going to be implemented, making sure there's fair access, make sure there's fair access, not only the foot in the door to be part of a genomic medicine implementation, but also making sure everybody understands this. Otherwise, people will, will, will not be as motivated or people will not be properly enabled to participate in decisions about whether to have genomic medicine be part of their health care. But there's opportunities, and we need to work on this, and we are. My last reality and opportunity um, sort of speaks more to workforce issue. Um, you know, diversity needs to be reflected in who's doing the research. Uh, we need to be thinking about the workforce in general um, and, and the workforce at the research level, at the clinical level, so on and so forth. Well, you know, we, we do look at data, um, and this is just from the NIH data book. And just tracking the number of individuals with who NIH support who are PhD recipients uh, across different groups, uh, different groups of, um, of from the population, and perhaps not surprisingly, we sort of see in the same kind of gap that we could have predicted, um, where individuals of European ancestry represent uh, the numbers are going up, but they're also going up in a, in a way that that the most significant group um, remains uh, individuals of European descent. Um, some communities, then you can sort of see some of the other communities um, um, at the smaller levels, and some communities like American Indian and Alaska Natives, they don't even show up on the graph because the numbers are, are so small. So this is not a reflection of society. This is a very distorted, but these are the individuals, for example, getting PhDs. Um, and there's, um, so they're similar. You know, we need a workforce. This is one example. There's other examples we give of other parts of the workforce where similar problems certainly exist. We certainly thought about this a lot at NHGRI and thinking what we can do, and, there's a, and, and many other groups are thinking about this as well. Um, we think about how to have dialogue with communities to sort of get more people knowledgeable about this field, this exciting field, and getting them more engaged to improve the genomics workforce overall. I'll just give you two examples, um, both of which involve sort of an education group we have at the Institute that has been quite strategic in a number of ways. So for example, for the past couple of years, um, we have been working with the Tribal College faculty to launch a new initiative called the Tribal College Consortium on Genomics Training, TCCGT. We are just aiming to sort of coordinate better the tribal colleges as well as other federal agencies to expand training and research opportunities in genomics and really to work with them to figure out what can we do to enable your ability to incorporate genomics more in the context of traditional tribal views. Um, and there's many complexities with that, but it has to start with a dialogue of us understanding what they need. And shown here is just sort of a picture from a workshop we held about a year ago, where we are trying to understand what, and they're trying to understand what we can provide and help 
and we're trying to understand how we can tailor some of the genomic literacy um, uh, framework and elements that we've been developing and tailor it so of, that would be of maximal utility uh, within the context of their tribal college education system. And then more locally, I can tell you that we've thought even locally about opportunities to start to engage youth um, and, and to try to get them more involved in thinking about genomics as a career opportunity. So we have this Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation program called Youth Career Connect, which is designed to support um, college readiness and workplace skills development for secondary students. And then we have a number of interactions with groups of students where they come to NHGRI, they come to NIH sometime, they learn about developments. We have career counseling in essence and point them to different opportunities because there's so many different ways to become engaged in the genomics research and genomic medicine implementation um, uh, workforce to really think about seeing um, how to match individuals and their interests to the many opportunities that can be provided. So those are two of our, our more local programs, but even um, that we've been had staff directly involved in, but we're also creating other kinds of opportunities for all levels of scientists who have been underrepresented, and not only from racial and, and ethnic minorities, but also people with disabilities, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, and so forth. So I'll just give you three other examples of things that, and some of them are, are very recent. This one is actually just getting out of the gates. We've partnered with the American Society of Human Genetics very recently to create an initiative called Human Genetics Scholars Initiative. It's an outside partnership with sort of a major important society, uh, professional society, the American Society of Human Genetics. We only launched it like two months ago. And what we aim to do is to identify, mentor, and help prepare a select group of high potential, diverse, early career individuals for professional success. By doing this, we're going to foster a community of researchers committed to diversity and inclusion. So a number of engagements we're going to have with them over a period of months in the hope of supporting them and getting the society also to help support them in a number of ways, encouraging their uh, continued uh, advancement um, in, the workforce, in the genomics workforce. Uh, right here within our intramural program at NHGRI, we have an intramural postdoctoral fellowship program aimed at, 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 at health disparities. Uh, particularly, we take individuals into this postdoctoral program and um, who are interested in conducting research at the interface between genomics and health disparities and, and prepare them. And we broadly define that, but to prepare them and engage them and hopefully help launch careers uh, whereby they can help be part of the research engine to inform us on some of these challenges I've been, I've been pointing out, they represent the uh, opportunity uh, or the potential to have us see some of the opportunities that can come out of understanding these problems a little better. And finally, for a number of years, our extramural program has had something called a diversity action plan, which basically takes some of our large um, extramural research programs, in some cases genome center-like programs or big initiatives, and couples to them um, basically uh, an extra element that particularly uh, aimed at some element of improving diversity, either in training or in, in workforce development or career development. It can be at various levels, and every program is a little different. But this has been sort of um, done for a number of years, and uh, we continue to, um, to embrace this, as actually do our grantees. It gives them out about around the country in very different settings in very different ways basically doing a bunch of experiments to see what could we be uniquely be contributing to enhance diversity in a number of ways, and then learning from each other to try to see what might be uh, disseminated uh, to work in other settings as well. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, and just in closing, I just want to point out that everything I just talked about with respect to diversity and health disparities really is just a slice of a set of issues uh, related to genomics and society, uh, which are getting more and more complex all the time for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the second you start dealing with anything that touches healthcare, there's just so many societal issues because healthcare is so complicated for so many reasons. And of course, our institute has, has, has been embracing the research in this area actually since the beginning of the institute, essentially, exemplified by something called our Ethical Legal Social Applications Research Program, or LC Research Program, ELSI. And uh, that's an extramural research program. But even within our intramural program, there's a number of, of investigators that really focus on major research topics related to the interface of genomics and society. And so everything I talked about is really in a broader context. And there's so many other areas that we study um, uh, in, in either our extramural programs or our intramural programs. These range from how to engage uh, different communities, including diverse communities, which I touched on 
Many issues associated with privacy and data sharing and the complexities of that, especially when you think broadly into different communities and some of the, the nuances that you find when it comes to privacy in different communities. Dealing with the issue of trust more generally and understanding it at a fundamental level. I touched on the international cohorts, but there's an international dimension to almost all of these societal issues. And even if we understand it in the United States, it actually gets even more complicated when you go to different parts of the world and different cultures. There's a whole host of issues related to what's called direct-to-consumer genomic testing or genomic analysis, or DTC, another part of our areas of research involved in genomics and society. Lots of issues about return of genomic information to individuals, what they want to know, what they should know, what they might, how, to, how to prepare them for that, and so forth. So many issues around that as well. And finally, many issues, as I sort of already touched on, but just dealing with healthcare professionals, what they understand, how this interfaces with the, the work that they do, the clinical workflow, interdigitational electronic health records, and so forth. Many complex societal issues at that interface as well. So that's what I wanted to tell you in terms of the new realities. In terms of the road ahead, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Um, I, I think. The first part of my talk, it almost made it seem like all this was simple. It was just, you know, we just went after the genome, we figured it out, and the next thing you know, we had six highlights and we were implementing genomic medicine. That, that journey, I, I hope you appreciate, wasn't that simple. You know, it really looked more like this. It wasn't a simple straight path. It was very complicated, like all research. It's just really complicated. I, I really want to emphasize, uh, you know, I, I was there at the very beginning of the field. I was there on day one of the genome project. You know, don't think for a minute we knew what we were doing. To be honest with you, I still don't really think we know what we're doing. If we knew what we were doing, it, it would be too simple. Um, there, I really believe that. If you go to my office in Building 31 above my door, um, inside my office, I have a quote from this guy who I assume you recognize. And it really is one of his quotes. He said, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. So <laughs> I, I readily admit, and it's been the, 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 the sort of characteristic of genomics, we, we sometimes make it look so simple and straightforward, but none of this is, and because if, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be, re all of this is research. And I hope you appreciate that this middle piece that I talked about related to diversity is just a classic example. We don't totally know what we're doing. That's why we have to constantly be asking questions. We need to be constantly talking about this. We need to be constantly researching this, and we'll figure it out. And we always seem to do that in genomics, but we, we have to recognize that so much of what we are doing, we are have to correct our course because we're oftentimes uh, sort of slightly going in the wrong direction and we need to sort of self-correct. And every once in a while, the Institute does this in a very systematic way, and we're about to do this again. And by that, I mean we strategically plan. Um, so we strategically planned a lot during the Genome Project. When the Genome Project ended, we put out a strategic plan that we published in Nature in 2003, described what was going to be needed. And then we strategically planned again in about 2010 and published in 2011 a strategic plan that's guided us for the last eight years. The Institute's going to publish a new strategic plan in 2020, and we're sort of taking the 2020 vision metaphor, as you can see. And, um, and that's a big part of what we're doing over about a two-year period, and uh, where we are, you know, about a little over, you know, just about a year before, from right now is when we'll be submitting this publication, or submitting this paper for publication. And you know, we, we need a lot of people to help us, and we've been engaging lots of people along the way. Um, and so we certainly need all you, and, and we, would, we would really love to hear from you. Um, the Institute is uh, very much um, one that listens um, and, and really tries to synthesize lots of things. I've embraced this as something that is critically important in this general area. Uh, you know, of, of, of health disparities and, and its relevance uh, to genomics and vice versa. Um, so Vince Bonham, who I think many of you know, is sitting right here, is my senior advisor. He's just my senior advisor in, in genomics and health disparities. Michael Hahn is somewhere, he's in back there, and works with Vince. And we regularly strategize about many of these things, including the creation of this, of this lecture series. And they're also being very helpful in helping to think about many of the issues around um, health disparities and genomics as it will uh, play into the formulation of our strategic plan, but we also welcome your comments as well. And we're, I'm about to sort of open the floor up for any comments that relate to anything I said, or, um, or, or the things you want to say that are relevant to our strategic plan. And I should put in two other plugs, and then I really will, I want to hear from you. One plug is if you're interested in a regular update about genomics, my staff and I put together a monthly newsletter. Now, you're welcome not to subscribe to it, but if you want one extra email a month, feel free to sign up for that. Um, and the second plug I guess I could put although I'm not going to remember exactly the date and time, is that we are next week 
are going to be having a town hall related to our strategic planning process um, on uh, uh, next, sometime next week. Um, I'll look it up in a second. And it's in, it's in Lipset Auditorium, and you'd be welcome to come to it. That's where we're actually going to formally start talking about some, some feedback. Actually, I sent emails. So if all you were on the NIH email, we'd send out emails, uh, at least a couple of them. Um, and uh, I would welcome you to sort of join us at that, or you could come in by videocast uh, and so forth. So I will stop there, and please, I want to hear from you. The cohorts? Yeah. Yes, there was a glaring area yeah. that had no uh, research going on. Did you speak to that? Um, uh, uh, there's probably multiple glaring areas. Well, there's a, there was a continent. I don't even know which one. I could think of two, but I'll be curious. I, I, so it's actually really interesting. I can tell you a few things about this as soon as I find a. Yeah. So is, are you more bothered by Africa or are you more bothered by South America? Because you could be bothered by both in different ways. But um, so, so um, you're absolutely right. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interest and attention. Uh, being paid to this. Actually, this is a slide. I can actually tell you this is a slide that will actually be shown next Tuesday morning at a meeting over in the Porter Neuroscience Building. It's a closed meeting, so it's not like I can invite people. Where um, the, he the heads of international research organizations, which you know our director is just one of a whole as a representative there, but they all get together once a year. And there's actually, a, and, and this, is the, this is the big shots of the big shots. This is all, and they get together, and there's a whole topic about all these international cohorts. And I'm sure one of the things, and how to coordinate them better, but also the recognition that some countries are not, and some continents are not represented. And, and, and lots of discussion about how to sort of improve that situation. So this is H3 Africa. So, so, so H3 Africa, so the, the slight difference is, so H3 Africa is a program that um, HRI is a co-lead on. Out of the, coming out of the common fund is human heredity and health in Africa. These represent um, longitudinal population studies where clinical data and, and genomic data is being captured. And in reality, H3 Africa has some individuals collected, but not so much clinical data and not so much Date, not so much set up in a way that you could go back and recontact the people, and so it's really not set up as a cohort study. So, co yeah. So, so a lot of this, a lot of these have to do with the and also, yeah. There's, there's there's a few other nuances. Now, the desire, of course, is absolutely going forward. We should think about what could we could do to create a cohort-like study on the African continent. I would argue similarly in, the, in South America as well. Caribbean. All right, Caribbean. Oh yeah. I mean, lots of places. Well, India and China. They're, they're probably the most populous place. Yes. So China, China has some big numbers associated with it. Yeah. India does not. India does not. Yes. Okay. Um, in your talk, you had mentioned uh, how one of the goals is to educate medical providers. And I was wondering, since you're doing work with the Native community and it is a very uh, uh, I mean, certainly that's on the list. Absolutely. I mean, you could you could come up with lots of of groups. Um, we actually have a sort of a network group that we founded of of of, um, of of healthcare groups. I mean, professional societies. I actually don't know if the Indian Health Service is represented on that, but that's we, we are trying to develop these kinds of networks to try to have sort of both dissemination mechanisms, but also to try to get them working together and sharing materials and sharing best practices and so forth. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. 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 You should add anything, Vince. You should feel free if there's anything you want to add to any of these good so, questions. As you know, we work with the Tribal Advisory Committee, Dave Wilson's office, which IHS is Yes. Um, we had a lecture in Harvard to help out, especially in cancer, many of these new drugs. There's many people in the trial that are not represented, no. not different. Um, do you see a do you see a vision of the FDA kind of not approving drugs as well as applicable to you know various populations? It seems like they're just jumping the gun as soon as a drug is shown to be effective for a certain 
So, so the specific question, I, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, and it's a recognized issue. And it, you know, it has, it, it, if done right, it actually has great promise to actually prove that, that some drugs that don't look so good might actually be better if you just stratify them properly. So you know, by the simple logic, this should be so much better. Um, this, it's interesting, Vince was just at a, uh, just organizing a meeting we're having with the FDA around to help have help them help us with our strategic plan. And I mean, it'll be an interesting, it could be one topic we could certainly explore with them. But but we're, we're getting general input, but that would be a great example of something. You know, this all, this plays, you know, pharmacogenomics is basically a genomic test. And just like any of these other genomic tests, they don't hold up well on, on, on non-represented populations. And so it's almost as pervasive as the same pervasive issue that we've just got to improve every one of these, the way we design these studies, or we're gonna really limit the utility of genomic medicine. Other questions, comments? Yes. So do you see another barrier for pharmacogenomics, particularly cancer, is the cost of these drugs? Not only how they're distributed uh, based on the research that they're tested on, but once they come out, they're so costly, that might not be getting long-term data that we need. So, and do you see and do you see anything unique about genomics that makes that worse? Or is it just a problem in general that? Well, I, or, I think it's the targeted based cancer therapy drugs right. that are too costly for people to use. And if they don't use them, then we're not going to get the data to continue to design. Right. So, and, and, I, and I, when I hear that argument, I, I guess part of the logic is that if, they're, if we limit who gets the drugs, then, then that means that they're, they'll, they'll, the prices will be even higher. Because, but the problem is, we, but at the same time, nobody wants to give drugs to people that's not going to work. So, so of course, this plays into the economics of drug development and the economics of healthcare. And I have to just acknowledge that those are those are huge societal problems that that I, we can hardly put on the back of, of even the field of genomics. I mean, we have to we have absolutely have to deal with those. But 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 you know, we would hope that that there, in the long run, genomics might help that. But there might be unintended consequences, and then we're going to have to grapple with it. I mean, one of the things I've always hoped for, and there have been some signs, maybe it's true, is uh, it was what we were almost talking about, is that there might have been um, uh, drugs that were in development that when they, they were found to not be particularly effective or they had really serious adverse, because the studies were done blind to genomics. And if genomics had been used to, if we would have the data, we could stratify it, there might be drugs that are put on the shelf that are just never gonna come to market. But if they could come to market with a limited, or you know, somewhat limited genomic use, then all of a sudden you might actually, those might be able to be repurposed. And they, otherwise they're just being shelved. And so that's always been a hope, but you have to do the studies to prove it. Friends, do you wanna have any last words or any comments or things that are not covered? No, I just want to thank you for sure. coming uh, today and uh, presenting to the interest group. Okay, thank you. Hey. <laughs>